When you look at the life of Paul, and you walk through both his life and, and acts, and you look at what he wrote in all of his epistles, one of his characteristics that stands out was that Paul was extremely Christological. He loved Christ. His focus was Christ. When, when you read and, and, and listen again to what his word says, think about this for a moment. Paul proclaimed Christ. Paul preached Christ crucified. His goal for believers was for them to become complete in Christ. He exhorted believers to set their mind on things above where Christ is seated at. He exhorted believers to walk in Christ, imitate Christ, to know Christ. As he wrote to Philippians, he says, I count all things lost for the sake of, for Christ. He wanted to know Christ. He said in Philippians that he wanted Christ to be exalted in his body. For him, it was greater to depart from earth so he could be with Christ. And as he famously said, to live is Christ and to die is gain. What came out of his mouth was Christ. What was the motive of his life was Christ. What was the aim of his life was Christ. What was his focus, his mindset was Christ. What he challenged all the readers to emulate, whether husbands or all believers, was Christ. And my question that I have is, why? Why? What is so significant about Christ? What is so significant about Christ that Paul would suffer, that he would both live and die for? And as you see on, on the PowerPoint there, what I want to answer today is what is so compelling about Christ. There was something so glorious about Christ that caused Paul to live, to speak, and to write about him. And, I, and I, that's my hope today. Next week, I have a, I have a chance to come back and, and we'll, we'll look in more about how to imitate Christ. But today, what I'd like to do, and I really am a one-trick pony, right? Or I'm a, I'm a one-issue candidate, so to speak, right? And, and it's, it's about Jesus. And my hope is, I know you've heard about Jesus every week here in every Bible study. But my plea with you is to once again Dive into the word with me, and we can just sit back and gaze at the greatness of Jesus. So with that in mind, turn with me to John chapter 1. And my hope is this, the answer to this question, what is so compelling about Christ? What is so compelling about Christ? And what i like to do today in my pursuit is we're not going to only go through one particular passage in the book of John. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at four passages and we're going to see four characteristics that made Jesus so compelling. Yes, I know, we, we could go through week after week after week after week and look at attribute and after attribute after attribute about Jesus. And it's exhaustive. I mean, that's why John said he, he couldn't even put every, all the works and all his miracles in this book because there would be too many. So I have tried to condense it uh, today. And so the first attribute, that, that amazes me about Jesus is that he is creator. He is creator. And please follow along as I read John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And John writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, Nothing came into being that has come into being. John doesn't hold back. As soon as he writes this gospel, he declares that Jesus is God. He was the Word. 
And this word was with God and was God. And what did this word do? He declares in verse 3 that all things came into being through him. All creation came into being through the word. Now, just by way of study, when you're reading this, sometimes I know I've asked myself, well, what is the word? That, that's a unique phrase. And so if you look down at verse 14, John helps us know what the word or who the word was more accurately. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The word who was the creator, became flesh. God became flesh. That is Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus is the creator. Now, oftentimes when we think of creation, when we go back to Genesis 1, we think in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Often our minds will think and primarily think, okay, God the Father is creator. But all three persons of the triune Godhead had a role within creation. And in the New Testament, here John emphasizes that Jesus is the creator. Paul does in Colossians 1, and the author of Hebrews does in Hebrews 1. In Colossians 1, verses 16 and 17, this is what Paul wrote. For by him all things were created both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Paul declared that through Jesus, everything that we can both see and not see, is and was created by Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 1, in verse 1 and 2, the author writes, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Shortly after that, in Hebrews 1, when the question is being asked about Jesus, it says this in verse 10, And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Jesus was creator. <clears throat> what is so compelling about Jesus is that he was creator. The Lord spoke, and it was. I, just, just think with me for a moment. I know you guys are all brilliant, right? You guys are mine, just sharp as a tack, right? Um, but just think about this. You know, I, we have Legos at our house. And I, I like Legos, and I, do, I really like Legos. I used to like Legos more, but where am I going with all this? Um, when, when you get a Lego pack, and of course you have to save for five years to get one pack of Legos, but um, they're so expensive. But when you, you put together Legos, it's much easier when you have directions to put whatever you're building together. Unfortunately, what happens after we're done, they all get thrown into a big uh, bin, and now you've got to create you know, something new. So it's easier to build something when you have directions. Much more difficult to build it when it's just all one big pile. But can you imagine trying to build something when you don't have anything? Jesus is creator. He created something out of nothing. Unbelievable. In fact, he did it, as the Bible says, in six days. Unbelievable. He was so powerful that he could speak creation to existence, and he did not lose one ounce of his power. It was not like a Tesla or Rivian. He likes Rivian, sorry. It was that where you had to drive for a little while, and then what did you have to do? You had to recharge. You, didn't have to get, you had to get the battery going. 
His battery never was depleted. This is Jesus. You know, let me just tell you some things about creation. A long time ago, back in the 90s, I had the privilege of majoring in biology, getting a minor in chemistry. I don't say that because I'm anything special. I've forgotten everything anyway. But... um, uh, but just to say, uh, you know, a long time ago, I, I had the joy of studying science, and the Lord changed my heart to come out to seminary. But when you think about creation, you think about Jesus, not only did he create something out of nothing, but let's consider for a moment some of the greatness of his creation. And I, this is from one book on creation, and it talks about sea cucumbers. And sea cucumbers, you know, we're not, hey, somebody, you call this way, hey, what's your favorite creature? Nobody, nobody raised their hand, hey, a sea cucumber. That's pre- oh, really? Okay. That, that's not what they say. But if you think about a sea cucumber, these sea creatures, they feed on plankton, tiny shrimp, and other organic particles. What's interesting about them is that there's a peculiar variety of fish known as the pearlfish. And this takes shelter during the day inside the sea cucumber. Now, interesting about the pearl fish, though, you know what it does during the day? It feeds on the internal organs of the sea cucumber. Now, that would not sound good. It doesn't sound good. But the sea cucumber is not harmed by this. And why is that? Because it can regenerate its own organs. The sea cucumber has an amazing defense organism. When it's attacked, it can expel all its organs. But good news, it can regenerate them all. And so, so it's, it's, back, it's back to square one. Another defense mechanism by the sea cucumbers is that it, it creates or secretes a glue-like substance. And some have said if you get this substance on your hair, you're not going to get it off unless you shave all your hair. It wouldn't take me very long. But, but I say that to say is this is a sea cucumber. Who not only thought about a sea cucumber? The Lord. Who not only created a sea cucumber, the Lord. See, it's not, it's not just what so amazes me is the power that Jesus showed by creation. But it's the wisdom, the triune Godhead in coming up with all this. You know, one of my favorite classes in college was when I took anatomy and physiology. Because every day I was blown away by how much I don't know, one. But two, the, the body is so intricately made. Let me give you another uh, creature, a woodpecker. They're, they're, it's called a red cockadet woodpecker. And these, these, and these birds, they can peck up to 500 times a minute. So they strike the wood with a tremendous force of eight times per second. I know you, some of you mathematicians are thinking through this now, right? And the bird's beak hits the wood at the speed of about 13 miles per hour. Now, just think about doing that 500 times a minute. I mean, I have a headache just thinking about that at the moment, right? But how can this bird survive doing that? Good news. His head is constructed with a built-in shock absorbing system that cushions the brain. I I mean, all these vehicles nowadays have airbags and everything that, that, what, to help you in terms of impact. And here, the God of the universe created a bird that has a built-in shock-absorbing system. This is God. This is our great God. This is our glorious God. He is creator. And you can just walk through many different things, right? I mean, one of the things we were amazed about, even thinking about creation, is we joke about my, uh, my wife being pregnant. Um, lo and behold, our dog got pregnant um, last, uh, last year, um, and, uh, and she had nine puppies, go figure, five girls and four boys. Um, and, um, and so my wife's dream of being a midwife, right, um, she, she, uh, she helped deliver all the puppies. And, um, and, and I say all this to say it, it was amazing, right? We didn't have to teach our, our dog, Dakota, how to be a mother. She just instinctively knew. She, she, we didn't have to t- teach her Lamaze, right? I wasn't sitting there, you know, we weren't doing any of that stuff with the dog. She just instinctively knew. 
And we just sat back, we were amazed, and just say, wow, God has caused this dog to know that. And we, we were amazed, and just to watch her take care of her puppies. I wish she would have done it longer, um, but, I, but, but I say that we were just amazed by here, this, our great God designed this animal in this way. So when I think about what Paul wrote, and he, he was so in, in, uh, desirous to please Christ, what is so compelling is that he's creator. He made you. What is also so compelling about him? He is all-powerful. Turn with me to John chapter 6. Now, to be fair, his creation is an example that he is all-powerful. But I wanted to give you a big picture of his omnipotence here in John chapter 6. What is so compelling is that the one that we sing about, the one that we identify with, he is the all-powerful God. In John chapter 6 and verse 15, Jesus had just fed thousands of people, up, estimates up to 20,000 people. I 5,000 men if they were married and children, up to 20,000 people. And after he fed all those people, look at me at verse 15. And John writes, So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. And after getting into a boat, they started to cross the sea to Capernaum. It had already become dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea began to be stirred up because a strong wind was blowing. Then when they had rowed about three or four miles, we'll pause right there. So what is going on here? Jesus had just fed, as I mentioned, all these people. He goes and he's taking some time to be alone. The disciples get into a boat and they want to cross the Sea of Galilee to the other side. These disciples, many of them, were fishermen, which you can assume they knew how to what? Fish. They knew how to get in a boat. They knew how to navigate a, a vessel in the, in, in the water, right? And they had to get from one side to the next. And so what happens? The sea began to be stirred up because a strong wind was blowing. <clears throat> when you look at all the accounts of, of this story in the different Gospels, a, a sudden storm arose. If you look at the topography of that area and look at the landscaping, the Sea of Galilee lies nearly 700 feet below the sea level in what's called the Jordan Rift. And the hills, they, they say they rise up to 2,000 feet above sea level. So there's almost a 3,000 foot gap, right? In, I mean, distance and elevation. And what happens is because of the sharp drop of nearly 3,000 feet, it creates violent storms the cooler air often would rush down and, and touch the surface of this lake, surface of the sea. And it would churn up the water into these white caps and create dangerous conditions for small boats. These disciples were now in this spot. They were rowing. Look how long they rowed. It says in verse 19, Then when they rowed about three or four miles... Now, you may say, that's not that far, right? I don't know if you ever tried to do it in a canoe before, three to four miles or in a rowboat, right? Um, it, it, that's a lot of work. I know for you guys, are all strong, right? But, you know, for me, it'd be a lot of work. And, but I bring that up to say, if you look at all what was going on, they started in the evening between six and nine. And we look at the account, what we find in the other accounts is that when Jesus comes to them, which we'll see in a moment, it was the fourth watch in the night which was now early in the morning between 3 and 6 a.m. And so when you put it all together, they had been rowing potentially from 6 p.m. in the night almost to 6 a.m. in the morning. Even if you truncate that hours in any way, you could say nine hours of rowing. 
and they were not able to get to the other side, right? Because of this storm. The storm was stifling their ability to achieve their goal of getting to the other side. The storm was that virulent. It was that violent. And what happens? Verse 19, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near to the boat. They're not able to make progress because of the undulating waves, right? Up and down, up and down. And Jesus just walking like a, just like a day at the park. A nice stroll coming out there. I mean, I pause there as I think about that. He was able to do what they couldn't do. One phrase that comes to my mind when I think about Jesus is he is and does what I am not and cannot. Jesus is and does what I am not and cannot. This is Jesus. What humanly they were not able to do, Jesus did. And look here in verse 19. Jesus walks on the sea and he draws near to the boat and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. His power was seen that he could override the properties of H2O. If you think about his ability to control H2O, or as I, you know, I say is water. Jesus had the ability to turn water into wine. Jesus had the ability at a storm to say stop and it would stop. Jesus had the ability to have the properties of H2O to be able to walk as if it was a hard surface. Who can do this but Jesus? He is that powerful. He is all powerful. Not only does he have the power over dihydrogen oxide, right? Look what it says. Verse 21. They were willing to receive him into the boat. And immediately, that boat was at the land to which they were going. What's fascinating about this, we understand that word immediately. Jesus gets into the boat, and they were in the middle of this sea, and immediately, they were on the other side. Somehow, they had, because of Jesus, they were able to move from that middle of the sea immediately to the other side. Who could do that? Jesus. Who could trans transcend time? Jesus. Who has the power over any property, over any demon, over any, any other authority? Jesus does. This is Jesus. He is all powerful. He could touch somebody and they'd be healed. He could say, You are healed. He could say, Lazarus, come forth. And who came forth? Lazarus did. He is all powerful. You have heard these stories before. But I think, I know for me, I'm guilty of this. I forget about his great power. When I am walking through a trial in my life, and it seemingly never ends, and I, I, I think, Lord, I know you're powerful, but tragically, I doubt it. And, and yet Paul could say, I can do all things through whom? Through Christ who strengthens me. I'm guilty, I'm guilty. I'm ashamed that I, I, I don't lean on that, I don't trust that. But this is Jesus, he's the all-powerful God. Listen to what John Piper said. With a word, Jesus commands the dead to live again. He rebuked a fever and it left Peter's mother-in-law. He planned for a fish to swallow a coin and then get caught with Peter's hook. And as he takes five loaves and he fed 5,000 men and he makes a fig tree wither with his curse. Who can do this? Jesus. Who can walk on water? Who can transcend time? Jesus. What is so compelling is this, is that he is creator and he's all powerful. Let me give you another one. I love this story. Not that I didn't like those stories, don't get me wrong. Um, but turn with me to John chapter 18. What is also so compelling about Jesus. He is authoritative. 
Jesus had been in the upper room, he had spent time with his beloved disciples. He had instructed them. He had prayed to his almighty father. In the time of his arrest, the time when he would be physically assaulted was at hand. The time when he would hear his father say, and, and, and ask his father, why have you forsaken me, that is, with a hand? And Jesus in John 18, this is what it says. And John was right, an eyewitness account, and John writes, when Jesus had spoken these words, verse 1, if I didn't say it, I apologize, John 18, 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with, with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron, where there was a garden in which he entered with his disciples. Now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place, for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So let's get a picture here of what's going on. <clears throat> There's a garden. And Jesus and his disciples are there, and they go there. And who shows up but Judas? And Judas didn't show up with just some of his buddies, just a small posse, right? Jesus, excuse me, Judas shows up to, her, to go after Jesus with a Roman cohort. And a Roman cohort um, often numbered 600 men. And it wasn't just 600 men who were amateur soldiers. At the time in the history of the world, this is the best and the most well-trained military in all the world. Now you have 600 of them come with Judas. But who else comes? And officers from the chief priest. The temple guard. Officers that gave protection, security, high Skilled security is with these chief priests and the Pharisees. So all these people come, maybe 800, if we think all the, all the leadership plus all the officers in the Roman cohort. And here's Jesus with the band of, of these disciples that are with him. And not only did they come, what did they come with? came with lanterns and torches and weapons. They came armed. Now, some of you may say your, your fist and knuckles are all you need, right? But, but these came armed. This is the situation. I love what happens here. Verse 4. So Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, as I mentioned, all the things that he was about to do, he was going to lay his life down. All the things that were going to come upon him went forth and said to him, said to them, excuse me, whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am he. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. Look what happens, verse 6. So when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and they fell to the ground. Jesus said those words, I am he, and all of this phenomenal military might and all these chief priests, all these officers, they all took a step back, and they fell down to the ground. Why? Why would they fall down? Well, look what was said. Jesus said, I am he. The Lord declared to Moses that I, his name, I am. Jesus declared to all of those people there, in the garden, that he is God Almighty, that he was the authority. One person writes this, 
they fell down because of the power of Jesus' word. All he had to do was say his name, the name of God, and they collapsed on the spot. There he is, one single, unarmed, lonely figure, and they're an army equipped and manned for word, and he could just say a word, and they're down flat. There flowed with him Jesus such a power and such a commanding authority which made him so infinitely strong they couldn't even stand up in his presence. What is so amazing about Jesus, so compelling, is when you think about what we remember today in communion where he died and he gave his life. He did that voluntarily. He's letting them know, hey, you're not taking me because you're more powerful than me. You're going to take me only because I'm letting you take me. As John said earlier, he voluntarily laid his life down on the cross. Oh, yes, the Jewish people, they mocked him. The Romans spat on him. They nailed him to that cross They put the robe on him. They put the thorns on him. Yes, they did inflict a punishment only because Jesus let them. He was authority. He is the authority. And he spoke and they went down just like that. Who who is like this? Nobody. He's Jesus. So as we think through all this for a moment, what is so compelling about Christ? He is creator. He spoke and it was. He's all powerful and he's authoritative. So here he is, the lion of Judah. But what else is so compelling about Jesus is he's the lamb of God. Turn with me to John chapter 13. Jesus showed such great humility In John chapter 13, look with me at verse 1, and this is prior to him going out to the garden. And John writes in John 13, 1, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper and laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter, and he said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, Then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. He says, verse 11, for he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. So when he washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? And he goes on and we find out it was an example What is so compelling about Jesus is that the creator of these disciples, the creator of you and I, the king of kings, the one who is receiving praise from the angelic being in heaven, the one who was in a location where there is no sin in heaven, the one who was the God of all gods, the Lord of all lords, gets down and he washes their feet. Why is this so amazing? Well, well, one, think about the dirtiness of the feet. And we all know about dirty feet, right? But they didn't have Nikes or Skechers. I don't know if you wear those anyway, but um, 
That's, that's, that's it, what I got for shoes. Anyway, um, Converse, Chuck D's, maybe that's another one, right? And you, uh, Vans. Um, and you have all those, and they help keep your feet, what, cleaner from the elements outside. But here there were these men that had sandals that were walking often on dirt paths. And Jesus gets down to wash them. Think about, secondly, what was so significant? Feet often don't smell that good. Our children play soccer, regrettably. I'm joking. Um, I, I love soccer, right? Um, but they play soccer, and some of them have, have they, they've been blessed to play collegiately. But I, I say all that. We've been around soccer for a long time. <laughs> and, and you know when our kids come home from a soccer tournament and they open up the so- their soccer bag. And, and the smell is unbelievable. Even our dogs run away from that smell. I mean, it's, it's that bad. And, and it's like, whoa. And, and, if, and here Jesus is, not a big deal. He washed these smelly, dirty feet. A third reason it was so significant. For a superior to wash the feet of an inferior was absolutely unheard of in the Jewish or Roman culture. R. Kent Hughes says this, this was an electrifying act. The Midrash taught that no Hebrew, listen closely, even a slave could be commanded to wash feet. Yet Jesus did it in the humblest way possible, clothed only in a servant's towel. The incarnate son, God himself, had stripped himself and watched the feet of his prideful, arrogant creatures, end of quote. The feet were dirty, smelly. It was a superior to an inferior. What else I find so amazing about this passage is that not only did he wash the disciples' feet, from what we can gather, he actually washed the feet of Judas Iscariot. He was still there with them, even though he was going to betray Jesus, he had not yet gone to betray Jesus. John MacArthur writes this in relation to this text. He says, incredibly, incomprehensibly, the glorious creator and ruler of the universe was about to humbly wash the disciples' dirty feet, a menial task reserved for the lowest of the slaves. With such power and status at his disposal, we might have expected him to defeat the devil in an immediate and flashy confrontation and to devastate Judas with an unstoppable blast of divine wrath. Instead, he washes his disciples' feet, including the feet of the betrayer. He knew what was about to happen. He knew that a man whom he had walked with and had counseled and had spent many days and nights with was about to betray him. You know, it's easy when somebody stabs you in the back. Well, maybe it's for me, you're like, oh, what? What'd you say? And you want to get back at him. Here, Jesus doesn't do that. He overcomes evil with good. Now, ultimately, Jesus came For what reason to earth? He came to die. He came to give his life. He knew why he had come. And and he knew what was going to happen with Judas was part of God's eternal predestined plan. And yet he washes this man's feet. It is so rare in this day and age to actually see people show humility let alone a superior, let alone the king, show humility. But this is who Jesus is. When you think about what Philippians talks about, when Paul writes to the church of Philippi and he gives them instruction on how to be unified, the key to unity, he says, is humility. And he, and he says, let me give you the example of humility. And it says, have this attitude in you which was in Christ Jesus, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. 
And it goes on, Paul writes about Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But it goes on to say how he, he became obedient to death, even death upon a cross. Parents, we love our children, but at times, well, not our children, of course. I'm jo- kids on the East Coast, as Jack used to say, right? I'm joking. But um, right, they, they were what? They, they were, they're hard to deal with. You know, you're sitting there and they, they tap you and they tap you and they tap you, right? Or they do stuff and they break stuff and break stuff and they break stuff. I joke, right? And, and you get tired of that. And, and then you, but then what are we supposed to do? We want to we wanna love them. Even though when they may not say thank you back to you. Even when they may not honor you as, as what the Bible says. And I only bring that up to say that's such a minimal example compared to what Jesus did. What a glorious Savior. What is so compelling about Christ is he is creator, he's all-powerful, he's authoritative, and he's humble. I want you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we're going to look at verse 3. You all know what I have just walked through the book of John. You've heard about Jesus. If you've been here at Calvary at any time with Jay and all the elders and all the men who have gone before you to preach the word of God, that this, this has been a church that, that has proclaimed Christ. And yet this is my, my concern for my own soul and for the for here and for the Christians in America around the world. Verse 3 of 2 Corinthians. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and the purity of devotion to Christ. Let me read that again. I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by this craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Paul was a pastor. He wanted the the Christians at Corinth not to forsake Jesus. He didn't want them to go astray. Hold fast to Jesus. So what can help you and I do that? You pick a gospel. Read the gospel. Just sit and think about who Jesus was, what he said, what he did. Beg God, Lord, help me to love you every day. Help me to delight in you. Lord, where I am falling short, I am pleading with you, God. Help me to remove it. Help me to be satisfied in Christ and Christ alone. Jesus is much more satisfying than a Snickers bar, right? This is who he is. And we have, I, I say me, I, I lose sight of that. There's so many things that come in our lives, good things, hard things. And I don't want to minimize those in any way, but I know I'm guilty. That I let those things just take my gaze off the glory of Christ. When I went to Cedarville University back in the day, back in the 90s, I'm older I don't mean to diminish anybody who's older than me by saying you're old, so I apologize. And uh, I know you've probably heard this story before. A snowstorm had hit Philadelphia where I had grown up, and it was a blizzard. My parents woke me up at like 3 in the morning. They said, John, you got to get on the road now. I go, what are you talking about? And I go, you got to call you all these all the other college students that are um, – that are going to ride with you back to Cedarville. I said, Mom, it's 3 in the morning. And they go, we thought the snowstorm was just going to be a small one, but it's a blizzard. So I, I called. The other guy. Back then, you, know, you had the old you know, rotary phone. You know. We didn't have a cell phone and even a pager. Um, and so I called, and they finally get there. And we leave, we leave my house about 530, and it's, it's just snowing crazy. 
and I, I drive from Philadelphia, and I, I, I get to the Pennsylvania Turnpike toll road to, to, to go across Pennsylvania. Normally, you know, it takes like half an hour. It took me much longer than that. I had already seen like 20 or 30 accidents, and, and even uh, people that knew how to drive in the ice and the snow in Philadelphia, because of the conditions were so bad, uh, people were sliding off the road. And here I am in a station wagon um, and with three other kids, and by this time I'd already fallen asleep, um, my, and I'm driving, and I never drank coffee before that moment. Um, <clears throat> anyway, and so I'm driving, I'm like, what am I even doing in driving? And so we, we, we drive across the turnpike, and Pennsylvania has mountains, not like the mountains out here, but they still have mountains at 3,000 feet. And we're driving, I see cars in the distance, I'm on the, on, the, on the road spinning out, and I'm like, okay, I can't slam on the brakes, so you just kind of gently get off the brakes and you slow down, and by God's grace, we didn't hit them. And, and so we make it halfway, um, and it normally takes about eight and a half hours, it was already like seven hours in. And we, we stopped for lunch, and we stopped to fill up gas, and I got some more coffee. And, um, and I talked to my friends, how are you guys doing? Oh, we're doing great, Sean. Um, they've been sleeping the whole time. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, and, and, and driving. And, and so there's, you know, there's already um, over feet of snow on the ground. And, and so I leave there, and we go through West Virginia, and we, and we get in West Virginia. We're going over the mountains in West Virginia, and it's an absolute whiteout. And, I, and I'm driving, and I can't see anything. And next thing you know, you're right on the back of a tractor, not on the back, on the back. I'm, I'm a little bit behind, right, uh, of a tractor trailer, because and, and, you can't see them until you're right up on them. And so we make it to Columbus, Ohio, and this time it's about 12 and a half hours later, and and little did I know when I got to Columbus, because back in the day, you know, I didn't have, a, a, I didn't have Amber Alerts or anything like that on your phone or anything that, to tell you what's going on. And it, they, they shut down Interstate 70. And, but, of course, somehow I didn't, I didn't get the memo. And so here I am with my friends. They're our awake now. They're like, hey, are we almost there, John? Hey, <laughs> it's, it's another 45 minutes normally to get from the, to the college from where I was at. And it was pitch black we're out in the middle of the country driving Interstate 70. I, it's a complete whiteout. And I've asked myself, why am I going? But now I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm committed. I'm not stopping this close. And lo and behold, a tractor trailer gets onto the freeway. And it's at nighttime. And the only thing that I could see was the light on the tractor trailer. I couldn't see anywhere else. It was all dark. It's pitch black. And so all I could do was look at that light and follow the light. By God's grace, he actually got off at my exit, which is crazy because it's a small exit through a country town. And he got off, and I was able to follow the light. This is a dark world full of sin, stained because of all the sin and the evil in the world. But there is a light that you can follow. That's Jesus. What is so compelling? He is creator. He's all-powerful. He's authoritative. He's humble. The only way you can navigate in this life is by following the light. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your amazing and glorious grace. And I thank you, Jesus, for your patience with me. Thank you that you would die for me. I'm just a perfect sinner. And you gave your life so that I might live. I thank you for these believers here, and I beg of you that, that you would each and every moment, that you would galvanize their souls, that they would have a greater passion for you. Lord, I do also beg of you, if there are some here that have never confessed with their mouth that you're Lord, that have never trusted in you alone for salvation, that you would save them now, that you would regenerate their soul. I beg of you for the people in Burbank. Glendale, and the other surrounding areas. They're running for things that are of no eternal significance, and I pray that you would save them. May you use these believers to impact this community for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.